the topic of today's uh, conference is theory of everything. Uh, and I think that it is really hard to think of any scientific theory, let alone a theory of everything, without laws. Uh, scientists occupy themselves with the task of discovering laws and formulating them in a precise mathematical language in order to advance our understanding of the world surrounding us and of our, ourselves. Now, I'm not a scientist, but a philosopher. A philosopher of science, to be precise. So you may wonder, what can a philosopher tell, tell you about laws? What does he know? Now, let me explain. Philosophers by profession are interested in general questions regarding uh, the meaning of general world, words, such as the word of justice, the word uh, morality, uh, the word knowledge, time, space. And laws, the, the word law belongs to this category of uh, you know, very important terms that we would like to understand better. So philosophers basically would like to understand what it means that something is a law. What is the nature of laws? What do they do to us? And what is the relation uh, with the world? OK, so I would like to present you with, uh, with two possible approaches, philosophical approaches to the notion of scientific laws. I call these approaches governing versus non-governing conceptions of laws. Uh, and uh, let me start uh, with the first one, which I consider more intuitive and more appealing. Whereas the second conception, the non-governing conception, will be a little bit less intuitive, nevertheless, because of that, perhaps quite interesting. OK, let me start with an example. I hope everybody has heard at a certain point of their education about the law of gravity as discovered by this famous person, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, now, the law of gravity is supposed to tell us about how uh, material bodies behave when they interact with one another. In particular, it's supposed to tell us how planets and stars and galaxies interact with one another. So the law of gravity, according to this governing approach, uh, ensures that the planets that surround a star, like our, sol our, our uh, sun, that they will stay on their orbits and they will not fly away into the void. In other words, the law governs them. They basically, the laws tell those planets what to do. In this respect, laws behave as if they were rulers, as, as if they were kings or queens, as if they ruled their domains, as if the planets were their subjects that are supposed to obey. Okay, that's, that's, that's the, basically the, this idea. In this respect, the laws of nature resemble a different category of laws, and you may see this analogy, you may see this similarity between the laws of nature and so-called laws of the land, or laws in the legal sense, like legal rules and regulations. Okay. We all know that we have to obey certain rules. For instance, if you're a driver, and I believe everybody, I mean, the majority of people here know how to drive a car. You know that you have to obey a certain set of regulations, the traffic code, the traffic law, unless you can end up in a situation, if you don't do that, you can end up in a situation like this on, on the slide. So, for instance, you're driving a car, you're entering a city, and what, what do you have to do? I mean, you have to slow down, because there's a certain speed limit that tells you that this is what you're supposed to do. And by analogy, it looks like the laws of nature acts in the same way. The law of gravity, in a sense, tells the planets that if they enter a gravitational field, a gravitational field of a star, that they have to follow, cert uh, follow certain orbits, that they cannot stray from this, this orbit. So in this respect, it looks like laws of the laws of nature and laws of the land, they are quite similar. And there's one particular feature that these two types of laws share, namely that they both act as if from above. They are sort of, speaking slightly metaphorically, external from the world. Because in order to govern the world, you have to be from outside of the world, okay? 
So uh, the, the, the governing conception of loss stresses that loss cannot be reduced, as we philosophers say, it cannot be reduced to the totality of individual facts and occurrences. You may, you may think about making a long, long list of individual cases and instances in which bodies, material bodies, attracted each other gravitationally, but still the long list, even if it were complete, would never be identical with what we call the law of gravity. The law of gravity would be something else, would be something that each time, in each possible instance, would make sure that this is what's going to happen, that nothing else will happen. So that would be something external. OK, now I think at this point, perhaps uh, I have managed to convince you that the governing conception of law is the right one. Am I right? Now, if you think that's the case, think again. Because actually what philosophers do very well is philosophers love disagreeing with one another. And if somebody comes, with, uh, comes up with a conception such as the governing conception of laws, of course there will be always another philosopher who would say, wrong, this is definitely not the case, this is incorrect. And let me now start, about, start talking about this alternative conception. And first let me try to uh, shed a little bit of, uh, uh, to cast a little bit of doubt on this governing conception of laws. I've told you that there's an analogy between laws of the land and laws of nature. But unfortunately, I didn't tell you that the analogy is not entirely complete, that there are some definite dissimilarities between these two types of laws. Uh, for instance, one thing that is quite obvious, legal rules and regulations, they always have a lawmaker. They have somebody who creates them, who enacts them, who enforces them. On the other hand, with the laws of nature, things are not that simple. Now, of course, you may have an idea of a divine creator, and many people subscribe to this idea that there is a divine uh, person, a god perhaps, who actually created the laws. But this is by no means a necessary part of what we mean by laws of nature. There's a perfectly acceptable uh, naturalistic scenario in which laws of nature do not have a creator. So that would be one clear difference between these two cases. There's also another even more important difference. Laws in the legal sense, they come equipped with some sort of uh, sanctions. Now if you disobey, if you don't obey a law, of course you may be punished. So. This is basically what can happen if you disobey certain laws. You can just end up in this particular, in this place. On the other hand, it doesn't make much sense to talk about sanctions and punishment with respect to laws of nature. Okay, I mean, it's not that the planets follow their pre-assigned orbits for fear of retribution. That would make no sense. Rather, I think it's much more, it would be, uh, much more appropriate to say that they do that because they don't have any other choice. It's not as if they make some sort of conscious, conscious decision. So as you can see that this analogy between these two cases is not complete. And some people, some philosophers realizing that that's the case, they came up with an alternative conception of what laws are and what, is, what their nature is. And one of those philosophers is this famous, rather famous figure. This is an uh, 18th century Scottish philosopher by the name of David Hume. And his idea, general idea was that for him, laws of nature are nothing more than, as he put it, regularities, persistent regularities, persistent patterns that occur in in, in, the, in, in, in the several instances, individual instances of what is happening in the world. So for Hume, you may say that a law is just a long list. Actually, this is like a, an empty piece of paper, empty parchment, but you can imagine that there are some things on this, uh, that there are some, some items on this list, and a law would be just a long list of items, a long list of cases, of individual cases that really occurred in the history of the, of the world. So for instance, the law of gravity for Hume and Humeans, Humeans are people who follow Hume. So just to explain. So for Hume and Humeans, a law is basically like a collection, a long collection of individual instances. It's not any hidden power. It's not something that 
makes things happen. It's not the driving force behind those uh, instances, but just instances themselves, okay? And the reason why Hume wanted to do that, because he was, we call this position, he was an empiricist. He really believed in empirical investigations. He believed in what your senses would, would tell you and nothing more. And he realized that our senses, our experience, can tell us only about individual cases. This case, that case, that case. But it will never tell us about something that's outside, out of this world. So he simply just brushed away, brushed aside this conception of laws that would be somehow from, from outside, that would be not out of this world. Because we would never be able to know laws, laws of, 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 of that nature. Another useful uh, distinction that may help you understand the difference between governing and non-governing conceptions of laws is the distinction between prescription versus description. Now, according to the governing conception of laws, uh, law prescribe what should happen. Prescribe in the sense they, they create a norm. They say this should, this ought to happen. On the other hand, description is just merely telling you what's happening without any compulsion, without any necessity without any driving force. This is what humans would subscribe to. Laws merely describe, they do not prescribe. Okay, let me give you an example that would further hopefully increase our grasp of the distinction between uh, governing and non-governing conceptions of laws. And th this example is going to be rather artificial. I apologize uh, for that, especially for those of you who know a little bit about physics, because this is, this is going to be like a mockery physics, I mean, not real physics. So suppose that there are in the universe two types of objects. So there are some objects we call X particles, and there are some objects we call Y fields. And suppose on top of that, that due to some coincidence in the entire history of the universe, not a single X particle has ever entered a Y field. So there was just simply no occurrence of that sort. Nothing in the history, nowhere in the history of the universe we would have this interaction between an X particle and Y field. Now, in spite of this, if you are a follower of the governing conception of laws, you may want to say that still there may be a law that would tell you that if an X particle had entered a Y field, it would have behaved in such and such a way. For instance, it would be, let's say, deflected upwards, or maybe another possibility, and that would be another possible law, that, an X part, that the X particles would be deflected downwards. So these are options which, for the governing, for somebody who believes in the governing conception of laws, these would be two real options, two real possibilities. But humans would have none of that. Humans would say this is utter nonsense. I mean, if no particles, no X particles, have ever interacted with the Y field, it just doesn't make any sense to talk about any laws. Unrealized laws, they just don't exist. Laws are just combinations, not combinations, but rather collections of everything that actually happened, not what would have happened under some circumstances. For, for humans, this picture doesn't make much sense, as long as X particles never interacted with Y fields. Okay, so I hope that this uh, explains a little bit more what is the difference between these two approaches. There's one more curious consequence of humanism, as we call it, uh, this approach by David Hume and his followers. Uh, one quite interesting consequence. The, the consequence is as follows. As I said, uh, according to Hume, laws are collections of individual facts, totalities of individual facts. But you may ask the question, what facts? Past, present, or perhaps future? Now, unfortunately for Hume, or Humeans, this, this, this has to be a collection of all facts, past, present, and future. Which means, actually, that for humans, we can, we can know the laws of the universe only at the end of the world. As they say, only in the end everything will be revealed. So at this very moment, we, we can only make a guess. For instance, we guess that the law of gravity is really true. 
But on, on what basis? Only on the basis of our, of our past experiences. We know from the past that the law of gravity really you know, worked. But we never know, we, we may never know whether it will continue working in the future. And if not, it's not a law. It's just not a law. So you would have to wait until the end of the world. Now, this is a little bit discouraging, and for that reason, not everybody is very happy with this human approach to, uh, to the notion of law and lawhoods. OK, at the end of this presentation, I think you would like to hear from me which side to choose. I mean, which conception of laws and lawhood should we follow? Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you an answer to this question. Uh, philosophers are very, very good at debating things, at finding arguments, at poking holes at other people's arguments, but they are very bad at agreeing on one solution. So today, in the community of philosophers, we have followers of Hume, and also we have people who are strongly opposed to Hume. And they continue debating. And more and more arguments are, br are brought to the table. If you're interested in these arguments, you can read about them in the philosophical literature. So the only thing I can leave you with, that, with, with right now is it's your choice. I have presented you with two options. It is definitely your choice to choose your own poison, as they say. Thank you very much.